I looked at him and I looked at him suffering and I, and it was really in consequence of my uh, illness, it seemed. And so I reflected and I thought, you know, I think that there's light at the end of the tunnel and I think it'll be around our anniversary. And it happened to be exactly the same day. <laughs> Hi, Lewis. It's great to be here on Freedom Pact with you. Thanks again for the invitation. It's an absolute pleasure to have you back on the show. A lot has happened since we last spoke. You've toured the world. It seems like you've played in every country imaginable. What was that experience like? Yeah, that's for sure. Um, we met, we met lots of people. Uh, you know, Jordan meets lots of people because he does a meet and greet after each show. So he meets about 150 people every night, but I don't, I don't do that. But we go out for dinner in all these different countries and we've had people set up these dinners with people who are looking to make the world better, uh, influential people, artists, you know, all kinds, all, all kinds of people, politicians, artists, um, and so we met probably between 12 and 20 people at dinner every night in different countries. And so that really culminated in the conference that went on in London just a couple of weeks ago, the Alliance for Responsible Citizenship, and uh, which was a, uh, an amazing success, really. It went very, very well. The organizers did a great job of organizing it. The speakers were wonderful. The uh, audiovisual worked very well. And on social media, they're just killing it. So it looks like it's uh, it was su success and that something will something good will come out of it uh, in the near future. So yeah, it was really something to to travel all over the place and see what was going on in all these different cities because people locally would tell us what their concerns were and we found out that people felt like they didn't have anyone to anyone to form a community with with the concerns that they had so hopefully now after this conference people will feel like they have a community that they can count on and uh, so resources that they can find and uh, we can take this down to the local level of making change come from the bottom up, which is what has to happen with this, all this top down tyranny that's happening in the world, you know, that that's not sustainable. So, yeah, so it's, it's been good. You know, the, the talks aren't political, you know, they're, um, based on his book, which is more philosophical and psychological and, and religious. Uh, Douglas Murray actually traveled with us for the last European leg of the tour that it was maybe two weeks long. And that was wonderful to have him along. Uh, he is, uh, he's such a bright light for everyone. He, he can really, uh, he's a wordsmith. He's a poet. And, um, He's not afraid to say what he thinks, and I, I appreciate that. <laughs> yes, Douglas Murray. Interesting you mentioned him. When Douglas was on this show going back two years ago, he spoke about the importance of standing your ground. Now, as you host your own podcast and you're having conversations with all sorts of different people around all sorts of different topics that are quite controversial, are quite people have strong opinions about on both sides. How important have you found it to stand your ground in these conversations? Um, well, when I have a podcast, probably a lot like you, I ask questions and I don't really have any agenda for how it's going to go. You know, if the person has written a book or 
has some, something that I can see or read beforehand, I usually try to do that so that I'm informed about who they are. But, and I base maybe my questions on some of those things, but mostly I let it go. I let the conversation go where it might. And it's usually my guests that say, oh my goodness, I'm not sure I wanted to talk about all of that. I, I might have to think about that. And, and I always give people the option of reviewing the video and launching it if they want to or not. And I wouldn't say 100% of the time, but most of the time, it's fine. Everybody is, is fine with it. And I've just learned to be, uh, I've learned to be, I would say, I've learned to let my ego go so that I don't feel that I have a stake in, in the game. I'm more of a curious observer who's trying to find out something to share with my guests. So I, I don't really, I don't feel like I have to stand a ground. I don't have a ground except for except for the truth, you know, I mean, I'm just looking to see what the next right thing is, the next right thing, the next, uh, the next question that comes from whatever it is that my guest has been talking about, and that will lead wherever it leads. It's not up to me. No, something we talked about last time we spoke that resonated deeply with a lot of people was on the topic of your faith and how that tied in with your illness. And I saw a piece on YouTube a couple of days ago called Tammy Peterson Rosary Testimony. It was about a 12 minute piece where you were describing yeah, your journey with your illness and how the Catholic faith came into your life. And there was a point in the video that it, it, it really got me. And it's when you talk about your son, Julian, Julian, who's been on this podcast before. And you mentioned that when you were telling him about the illness, it was the look in his eyes that really got to you. Tell me a little bit about that moment when you looked into your son's eyes and what emotions that evoked in you. Hmm. Yeah, that was profound. That's the most profound thing that has ever happened to me. You know, uh, when I looked at him, I saw a deep mother to son love that uh, was going to be, it was going to be the end of that because I told him I was going to die in 10 months. And uh, when I looked and saw that, it reflected back to me that I was worthwhile. I was worthwhile in a in a way that I hadn't understood before. And, and, and I've come to understand actually that I was living my life really with some self-doubt and some cynicism. And I could feel, I think what I felt lift off my shoulders was all that self-doubt and cynicism. And then I could feel the Holy Spirit just fill me up and I, I just thought, you know, the doctors have an opinion about an in, informed opinion, but an opinion still nonetheless about whether I'll live or die. But, but, uh, the only, there's only God that knows when we live or die. And so that changed my perspective completely. And it was really, I think, love, love of self that was reestablished for me in uh, in a way that a child would just organically have love of self, an acceptance of who they are and a yearning for and a striving for uh, to do the next right thing, really, to be of service in the world. Um, so, yeah, that was life-changing. It was life-changing for me. You mentioned there about this feeling of being filled with the Holy Spirit and 
you mentioned in the video that that came as a bit of a culmination of praying the rosary, which we will talk about more. It was that coupled with the hundreds and thousands of hours that you've spent listening and watching your husband Jordan Peterson's biblical lectures. I wonder what it was about those lectures that resonated with you so deeply and ultimately what part they played in your Catholic faith? That's a very good question. Let's see. So I probably listened to 250 lectures. So it was a, I listened to pretty much everything that he talked about for, I think a year and a half. So that's, that's a lot, that's a whole education. And I had never gone to his university classes or I'd never gone up into his office and, uh, watched him write or anything, you know, I mean, I'd, uh, and I, I didn't, I didn't sit with him also when he was, uh, sharing his book with, with anyone. I had my own, um, I had my own interests that I was pursuing and we were busy, we had children. And so, you know, often husbands and wives, I think don't have necessarily a lot to do with each other. But it seemed when, when Jordan's first video went viral, I, I reflected on it and I thought, you know, if I don't step up to join him in this adventure, whatever it is and wherever it goes, and we didn't know, then we will no longer be married because it was a, uh, it was a, a complete change from what we had been doing. And so that, I think that first decision for me to just to go with him was, uh, a change for me. And I had already dropped what I was doing, right? Cause I had arthritis. So I dropped being a massage therapist and I had six months right there where I was looking to see which way my life was going to go. And that's exactly when this change came about. So it was, you know, I didn't plan it, but it was, the timing was, uh, was perfect for me because, uh, I, my kids were gone from home and I had given up my practice and said goodbye to all my clients. And I was free to, to attend to the next right thing. And at the moment I didn't even know what that was, but I went along and I kept a very low profile. I was anonymous and went out to see the protesters and I'd find out who they were. They didn't know who I was. So it was an interesting year and <laughs> to say the least. And, uh, but I had a question in my head all the time. What was I doing there? You know, I was listening. Um, you know, and some days I'd talk to him, you know, I think that your talk was pretty clear or some days I'd say, you know, I think that you kind of, that one kind of scattered a little too broadly. And so it was, it was hard to follow and maybe you didn't have enough rest or maybe you talked to that journalist in the afternoon too long and you were too tired. And so I spent my time really analyzing his performance and what I could do to enhance his performance. I didn't, I was listening, but I didn't understand why I was there, but I was asking, what am I doing here? What am I doing here? And near the end of that year was, uh, you know, was when I ended up becoming deathly ill and had this religious experience. So that's why I think that it had something to do with what Jordan was saying. And there was quite a bit of, there was, there's a lot of ethics. There's quite a bit of religion, not as much as there will be in the next tour, because his next book is called We Who Wrestle With God. So it's a, it's a commentary on the biblical stories. So it's, it's, it'll be even more, uh, based in, in, uh, the biblical corpus. Um, 
but there was enough of it there at that time. And there was enough, you know, he has, he has a great way of explaining what the stories mean. And I think I had never had the stories explained to me in a way that I could really grasp what was going on. But now I could, or at least it looks that way because when I ran up against life and death, uh, you know, God came into my life and showed me the direction to go. You know, I prayed, right? I prayed when I was ill and I said to God that I would speak publicly if I lived through it. And uh, that has been very interesting as well because that's exactly what I do now. That's my cent that's the central thing I do is talk to people. Listen and talk to people. Yeah. Who knew that was going to happen? I, I surely didn't. And when we last spoke, we talked about your illness. But one thing I realized when I was receiving messages and comments around the episode was people didn't really seem to understand just how serious the illness was. I think a lot of people only know the Tammy Peterson that overcame that illness, but they don't they weren't there for the journey. They don't realize the severity of the situation. And I heard your husband, Jordan, describe your illness as 100% fatal of what you understood of it at the time. Do you think that's a fair assessment of what you were facing? Well, I would say when we went to the doctor's office, when he first uh, realized that I had a much more severe cancer than he had first diagnosed, his hands were shaking in the office when he was handing me papers. He didn't want to tell me what, what it was they found out. And he told me that I had 10 months to live and I was signing papers for the next surgery, which they were trying to organize as fast as they could. But then I went to MD Anderson Cancer Hospital in Houston and I asked them and they said, no, there's no treatment. You can have surgery, but there's no chemo, there's no radiation, there's no, uh, there's no kind of cancer treatment because everybody who has this is diagnosed posthumously. They die, and then we find out what they died from. And I, then I went to uh, San Francisco, University of San Francisco Oncology Department. I talked to them. They said, no, there's no treatment for this type of cancer. Uh, go have surgery and one surgeon is as good as another surgeon. So just go home and have surgery. And so when I went home, my only hope was that the surgeon will, would take out the cancer and the cancer wouldn't grow again. And now it's been four years and it hasn't come back. So praise God for that because and praise praise everyone who helped me. You know, I had so much help. You know, my, my mother-in-law came a lot of the time. She was with me. My sister-in-law, she's a nurse, she came. My sister, she's a nurse, she came. My husband was there. My kids were there. My friends, I had friends that were there, that were there at my home, were there at my hospital bed. I mean, everybody was really so supportive and uh, I, um, I was very grateful. It was an amazing, it was an amazing experience. Even though I had lost 35 pounds, I was skin and bone, you know, my, my cheeks were hollow, my breasts were gone, my bum was gone. You could see my uh, shoulder blades sticking out my back and all my ribs. Like I had lost so much weight because I was eating and there was a leak in my lymph system. So the nutrition was leaking out into the interstitial space, filled up my feet and then it filled up my legs. And then they put a, a like a siphon in my interstitial space in my abdomen and drained off the liquid, but none of it was going to my cells. So I was just 
wasting away and getting weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker. By the time I was put in the hospital, I, uh, I wouldn't say I was completely conscious because uh, I, I had lost so much nutrition by then. I was very malnourished uh, and they didn't find the leak. So not me not eating any fat or anything it didn't help. It didn't help. It, sometimes it helps people if they kind of give the lymph system a rest, they recover, but I didn't, I didn't recover. And then in the hospital, they just put food right straight to my heart. And then I woke up three days later because my cells actually were nourished at that point for the first time in, I don't know, months. And, uh, you know, and that's when my friend came with the rosary. So I was in the hospital already. I may have, you know, when I was in that video, that rosary video, I think I said that it was the rosary. And so it was the prayers, all the prayers people sent, uh, the rosary that, 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 that uh, sustained me. That's what sustained me during the whole, whole I ordeal. But it really was the moment with my son that really brought faith to me in a profound way. Because my friend came to the hospital. Once I was in the hospital and awake, that's when she introduced me to the rosary. And I, she came every day for five weeks. When you are in a situation as severe as that and you're receiving this dreadful news or you're going into surgery knowing that everything rests on this one surgery what sort of conversations are going on inside your head internally because i'm lucky enough to have never had to have those internal conversations at this point in my life and i can't begin to imagine what those conversations are like could you maybe explain what that felt like at the time when you're facing something so severe and scary well the night before the final surgery, we were sitting in our apartment watching a television program and I could tell that neither of us were really in the room. We were so nervous that we weren't even sitting on the couch. We were scared beyond belief. <laughs> we were scared beyond belief. And uh, when I was in my 20s, I had had, I had been learning massage therapy at the same time that I suffered a, uh, another um, scare, health scare. Um, I had a, I had a, my ovary on the left side, had a cyst on it and they didn't know what it was. They told me it was cancer. And uh, this massage therapist that I was working with, I was very nervous because I was going to have to go in to surgery and find out what it was. It, it wasn't, it wasn't cancer after all, but, uh, the day of this meeting with my massage therapist, I was quite nervous about it. And so he sat at my feet and he just, his, he just moved my, his hands in a rhythmical manner up and down the arch of my foot. And he had me imagine that I had a white light that came in the top of my head. And I imagined it as a string of light that came into my body and I took it down to my ovary and I wrapped the string around my ovary and I asked it to not be afraid and to tell me what was going on. <laughs> and uh, I, uh, over about two hours, I felt this energy or like a profound change. And I, I felt something leave my side on the other side. Energetically, I found, I felt this and I thought, wow, that was, I guess, whatever was there seems to have gone out of me. Uh, and when I went to have the surgery, they said what they thought was the size of a grapefruit was the size of a golf ball. So energetically, it seemed like whatever was there and bothering me went back to the universe. And so I thought the night before this surgery, I should do the same meditation. So I had Jordan sit at my feet 
and do the same rocking motion on my arches. And I took all the prayers that people had sent me lots of prayers because we'd been on tour for a whole year. And my sister-in-law had written these prayers in colored ink and put them on the wall of my hospital. It was, uh, and so I took all these prayers and I lined people up on the beach in my imagination. And I breathed in all their prayers and I brought that love down to my kidney and I asked those cells what they were doing and not to be afraid and to tell me what was going on. But when I looked at them, they were the cells. It was as if they had turned away, they had turned away, they had turned away and they were having nothing to do with me. And I thought, Oh, cancer is whatever it is, is too much for me and probably too much for anyone. And so I think it's best if I give this back to the universe. And so uh, then the next image was smoke rising from me, not really smoke, but kind of dark darkness, darkness rising up and going back to the universe. And then I said to Jordi, hey, it's time to go to bed. It seems to be gone. Let's just go to bed. And we were very calm then. We were very calm and grounded. And the next morning we got up and we were very calm and very grounded and we went to the hospital and I talked to the surgeons and I told them what I did the night before to bring myself back and calm myself down. And they said they used the same intention and went in and everything came out without, sometimes, you know, cancer, it can, uh, I guess, it can, <laughs> it can make it difficult to get it out of the body without harming anything else. And so, the spleen is very close to the kidneys and it, it wasn't, it, 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 it wasn't a part of the problem. It just lifted out with no trouble at all. So they were quite amazed at how easily everything came out. Unfortunately, you know, there was a complication later that I nearly died from again, but they got all the cancer out in that day. And they said that what I told them about my intention of, um, I guess, what was my intention? My intention was to, to realize that this was not something that I was in control of, that it was bigger than me, and that it wasn't anything that I want, I felt like I needed to hold on to. It was something that I could give back to the universe. And so I guess they were just giving it back to the universe and they did, they did. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's a strange story, isn't it? It's a very strange story. <laughs> no, it is, but it is so, so powerful. Um, you mentioned that you had this really good support network around you that no doubt was pivotal in your journey with your illness and, and your recovery. I spoke to, to, to your son, Julian. I wanted to ask him this question, but I know he is quite a private person. And so I, I didn't want to ask him that question in the end. But if, say, your husband, Jordan, or your daughter, Michaela, were sat here with us right now, and we asked them what that time in their lives was like for the family as a whole, what do you think they would say? Hmm. Well, I think they would say that they were surprised by my serenity because I wasn't afraid and uh, I was peaceful and serene. So I think they were surprised by that when they would come to the hospital. They were, I was I was not afraid. And so then they weren't afraid. They were less afraid. You know, they were less afraid. I know that they were worried. And uh, Jordan especially was, uh, was very concerned. And I don't know. I, I imagine that they were 
I imagine that they were leaving it up to God as well, whether they knew it or not. Because when there's nothing you can do uh, except for be there, be there and be present and, and do the next right thing, if there's nothing you can do to change things, then it's best to realize that it's it's beyond you and and be okay with that. So I don't think they felt, I don't, I don't think there was any guilt or there was no blame or anything like that because I wasn't blaming anyone or anything or uh, I was just in a very accepting, uh, accepting of help. And uh, I just prayed all the time. So I was giving it to God, you know, thy will be done, not my will be done the whole time. And I think it rubbed off on everybody. <laughs> I imagine it rubbed off. I hope it rubbed off because that that is a good, it's such a good thing to know that thy will be done not my will be done is the way to move forward in life with the, uh, you know, it's the best way and you don't know how it should be, but any way that you might figure it out is not going to compare. So, yeah, that's a good question. It's uh, nothing I've asked my family about. I guess I could, but I haven't. I wanna tell you guys about London Nootropics. Now, I use Nootropics every single day, and my favorite way of doing that is through London Nootropics. London Nootropics are a company that make adaptogenic coffees made with things like lion's mane mushroom, ashwagandha, and so much more. They make amazing tasting coffee, and there are three coffee blends, all with different benefits and properties. The first one is Flow. I love using flow. I drink flow to get my mind right, to promote mental clarity and focus. It's like a productivity coffee. I drink it and I get to work and I smash through my work for the day. The next one I want to tell you about is called Mojo. This is good for promoting things like physical endurance, strength, energy, basically everything you need when you're on your way to the gym. It's like the ultimate natural pre-workout, but without all the negative side effects and jitters. I use it on my way to the gym. The third one is Zen. Now I use this in the evening. It's made with ashwagandha and promotes relaxation, helps combat stress, and really helps you wind down in that sort of final third of the day. So if you are interested and you think that you could benefit from any of these adaptogenic coffees, I encourage you all to head to londonnootropics.com and enter the code FREEDOMPACT at checkout for 20% off. Now, I'm not sure how long this code is going to be active. So if you think that any of these coffees sound like they can help you in any way, I would encourage you to take a minute now and go and check them out. And if you are interested, the code Freedom Pact gets you a whopping 20% off. Now, back to the episode. One part of this story that I think is just so, so beautiful is that things took a positive turn in time for your 30th wedding anniversary, which you actually said they would months before. Why do you think this was so significant? I think it was helpful to my husband to have that happen. I think he needed a miracle. I think that, uh, you know, he's a very mm, methodical person. He's a very deep thinker and I'm more of an intuitive person. And so having me tell him in June that I would be better, and I didn't even know what I meant by better, but I would be able to carry on in some manner by our 30th uh, anniversary. I don't, don't even know why I said it seemed far enough in the distance that, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe I would be okay by then. And I wanted, I wanted to give him some hope, uh, because he seemed to be suffering so much, but I didn't 
plan to tell him that or I didn't think let's see now what's going to make him feel better I didn't it wasn't like that it was more in the moment I I looked at him and I looked at him suffering and I and it was really in consequence of my uh, illness it seemed and so I reflected and I thought you know I think that there's light at the end of the tunnel and I think it'll be around our anniversary. And it happened to be exactly the same day, <laughs> which was, which was hard for him to deny. He was like, well, what do you say about that? I don't know. What do you say about that? Yeah. You don't say anything about that. You just uh, rejoice. <laughs> yeah. I think this is the perfect place to transition into the next topic I really wanted to talk to you about because this was a topic that resonated so, so deeply with a lot of the people in our first episode together. And we had a lot of messages about how this content helped people. Some of the clips um, around this topic in our last interview have done record numbers on this channel. And so I'd love to go back to this topic and it is on the topic of relationships love and marriage now of course you and jordan as we've already talked about have been through so so much in your relationship whether it was your illness your daughter michaela's illness at a very early age traveling around the world together on tour you've been through so much what do you think are the core fundamentals to one, a strong marriage, maintaining a strong marriage, and two, keeping the romance alive in a relationship? Mm. Well, those are two, yeah, two good questions. Well, first of all, truth. Truth was the foundation of our marriage. Uh, he asked me to tell the truth when he, uh, asked me to marry him. He said, you're going to have to tell the truth or this won't work. And uh, I talk, I took that very seriously and decided that uh, I would do my best uh, as we moved forward to tell the truth. And, but I think it was a, uh, a lifetime of learning to understand what the truth was. Uh, we're very complicated creatures, you know, and we're wily. We can, outsmart ourselves and we can outsmart other people. We're, we're very dis we're, I, I don't know. We, we, well, we're sinners, right? So, and we can find all kinds of ways to get around what is difficult and, uh, and it's no wonder and it's no wonder. So, and, that, and that's why, that's why the, uh, cause I, I've learned and I continue to learn about the biblical stories and try to understand what they mean. And I think that's why Jordan's work is so important is that we are such a, a, a bag of tricks, you know, to ourselves, let alone to other people, but even just to ourselves, that we need some rules to live by. And those biblical rules, those 10 commandments, uh, and whatever else you can find in the Bible to uh, understand and to get your feet moving in the right direction is really, really important. So truth was the basis of that, but the daily work that it takes to, uh, to get up in the right frame of mind and to, so I'll give you an example just of something that happened just this week. So um, we're in, we're visiting my daughter. She's about to, have, she, she announced that she's about to have another baby. And so she's going to have a baby in January, January 7th is the due date. And uh, so we're down here. She's got a six year old. Thank you. She's got a six year old daughter and, uh, and it's actually warmer here than it is in Kansas. And so, so we're down here with her. And uh, we got up one morning and I went to have a drink of water, which I have in the morning. And I noticed Jordan had drank my water and uh, I felt this anger. And I thought, huh, wonder where I wonder why I'm angry. And then I thought, oh yeah, I have to go to the doctor today. 
uh, maybe I'm nervous about the doctor and it's easier to be angry at my husband than it is for me to be scared of going to the doctor. So that's, so that, so I began to pray the rosary and I prayed through the rosary and I asked for my resentment to be lifted uh, from me. And so then I finished praying. We went out and we had some breakfast with my granddaughter and uh, then she was off to, she can be off to school. But this was Monday morning and Michaela's daughter this week was going off to stay with her dad. And Michaela said, because she's pregnant, she's very emotional and she finds it much more difficult to have her daughter leave on Monday and it makes her cry. Usually she can kind of stuff down her feelings, but with this pregnancy, she can't, everything is right on top. And so we were sitting at the door and Scarlett was getting ready to go and Michaela was sitting there and she was going to say goodbye. And Jordan comes up with his telephone and he says, you know, they were supposed to leave a package at the door last night and they didn't leave it. And these Amazon people and, and I just, with no resentment, with, with love and with kindness, I just said to him, you know, right now though, we're paying attention to, to Michaela and her daughter because she's going off to school. And he was able to, and he just dropped whatever it was that he was concerned with. And we focused and Michaela said goodbye. And then she had a little cry and I got to hug her and say that, you know, it is sad that she's gone and it's okay to cry. And, but it's good to get a hug when you cry because I think it's important to uh, seek out comfort when you have something that you're upset about. And I thought, you know, if I hadn't prayed in the morning and dealt with whatever crazy emotions I was having, if I hadn't prayed and got myself straight on the straight and narrow, I wouldn't have been able to uh, properly tell Jordan what the next right thing was for him to be able to hear it without feeling hurt. You know, that because there was no resentment in my voice. There was, I, I wasn't thinking, oh, first of all, he drank all my water and now he's not paying attention. Like, what are you doing? Right. I could have been, I could have been dismissive or something with him, but I wasn't, but I wasn't. And so he was able to let it go. And the moment was as it should have been. And then I could be supportive and, and, uh, and it w wouldn't make it worse than it was, right? I, you don't want to make your time with yourself or with other people any worse than it's going to be because we're all going to suffer and there's going to be times where we're, uh, where we're very uncomfortable and things haven't gone well and we're in a state, but we don't want to make that worse by bringing more of our own baggage to the situation and spreading misery everywhere. And so this thing that started with truth at the beginning of our marriage has come to now me getting up in the morning. And as soon as I wake up, I think thy will be done and not my will be done. Like, tell me what it is that is most important that I attend to right now before I make an error. And I try to do that as soon as I wake up because you never know what's going to happen, what, what's going to be the next thing that happens. And if you're not in the right frame of mind, then things are going to go worse than they have to be. And you don't know where that's going to take you eventually. You know, you, you think that these little things that we do don't matter, but it all matters. It all matters. Who, who knows what that small time of, who knows what that did for her daughter? You know, I, who, who knows that it was all as peaceful and as, 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 and as loving as it could be? Who knows? We don't know. We don't know. And so God forbid that I, that I put it, that I made it worse than it might have been. I just, I don't want to be that person. I really don't want to. it. What, what does Jordan say? It's not that he's brave. It's that he knows what to be afraid of. So I think I've learned to know 
what to be afraid of. Yeah. And then there was a second part to that question. Okay, well that's been a that's been a, that's been a a, jur- a journey. That's been a journey. And uh you know when I was real sick and George was real sick and we hadn't really seen each other for going on to 3 years. It was quite a while and he wasn't even living with me, so he wasn't even around and when he finally came home and he was still really sick. Uh I was feeling quite a bit better. I had spent the year really uh doing a lot of uh self-reflection and um uh, investigation into my past and mistakes I'd made and uh trying to uh make things right again and to to focus on the the proper path. You know, I was, I was doing a lot of work on that. And I was also physically trying to put myself back together. And he came home. And uh there we were. It was an evening and we thought, you know, what do we do? And we'd had a practice of of having dates, right? And which I've told you before. And uh, so we decided to have a date and because we had done this for 30 years, we knew what to do or what do you do when you want to have a date? Well, you set up, it, it's, I've been reading books about habits and that you teach kids habits. And so what's a, what's a good habit for a kid to learn when they come in the house after being out all day, they go to the sink and wash their hands. And so if you have your kids wash their hands every time they come in the house, eventually when they open the door, they automatically go to the sink and they wash their hands. Eventually, that's just a habit, right? And it's going to be a habit. And you want to, you want to have good habits. So when we organize these dates, you have to have cues, you have to have cues, the cue is to open the door before you go wash your hands. So the cues that we used were okay, date, what does that mean? That means have a shower, you know, that means, um, set up a room so that it's pleasant to be in. So when you walk in, you don't notice that there's a, a dirty plate in the corner that, that you didn't do the dishes that you, now you have to do the dishes actually. Cause so you're not going to come into the room and have a, an evening with your husband, you're actually going to do some more housework. And so, you, so you have to set up the room so that uh, the pillows are fluffed and the candles are lit and it's inviting and it's hospitable. So, so you're setting up hospitality because what you're doing is you're trying to set up a situation where you're going to relate to one another. And so it has to be hospitable. And if there's any resentment there, well, you're not going to exactly fold everything so that it's neat. You're going to kind of leave things because maybe she should have done this, right? So here I have to do this. I'll just throw the blankets in the corner instead of folding them because, uh, you know, she was home all day. She could have done this already. But the no, that's not the way we did it. We, it would be Jordan's job to go into the room and set it up so that it was pleasant and inviting. And it was my job because a woman is different from a man. A man's like a date. Yeah, sure. Let's have a date. A woman's like, date? Ah, like, am I up to, am I up to this? Like, do I really want to do this? Well, maybe tomorrow. So then, so, so now it's tomorrow. Okay. So I said, I was going to have a date yesterday, today, I'm going to have a date. So now, so I have to live up to my obligation because we live up to our obligations and we made a deal. And so we lived up in our marriage, we would make deals and then you have to live up to the deals. And the kids had to do this too. We, we had deals with them. They had to live up to those deals. And so, okay, so it's the next day. So first of all, I'm tired and I don't want to have a date. Well, have a nap, right? You know, have a nap. Okay, so now I've had a nap. So now I'm actually, eh, I'm not so tired. So that's something. And uh, so then, you know, have a shower. And uh, he's bought me some nice clothing. Put some of that on. Be grateful, right? Be grateful. Put some of that on. Uh And then as you do those, as you do, you know, you've had a shower, uh, you had a nap, you had a shower, you put on something nice. Well, you know, you might still not really want to have a date, but you might not be quite as opposed to it as you were at the beginning 
of the evening or at the beginning of the day. And so by the time you get in the living room, you're not really looking forward to seeing this guy who's, I don't know what he's done that week, something, something to bother you, uh, something that's bothered you. Maybe he, maybe he hasn't, you know, washed his dishes. So you've had to take care of him more than you wanted to. So the first thing to do probably is to tell him that and get it out of the way. If there's something really nagging that you haven't, that you guys haven't taken the time to talk about during the week, because you have to talk about things between you during the week and you can't leave them under the rug because when you leave them under the drug rug and you try to come together to have romance, they get in the way. Always they get in the way. So you have to bring up the, if there's something that comes up for you that, uh, your husband has done or something that you're just worried about that has nothing to do with your husband, but it's taking you away from the time that you have to be directly paying attention to one another. You have to bring those things up. So you have to be uh, humble in the way that you have to realize that there are things that bother you, uh, that you're not, that you can't force yourself to do something you don't want to do. And so, Pay attention to those things that are coming up as impediments to this moment that you're going to share and uh, accept your, vulnerabil your vulnerability that you're, uh, that you're someone who's bothered and uh, maybe you shouldn't be bothered. Maybe you feel like it's petty. What it is that you have to say is petty, but it, but it's bothering you. So I guess, I guess maybe you are a little petty. And so admitting that it's bothering you, whether you want to or not, you have to uh, have the humility to share what it is that's on your mind. And then your husband has to have the, tr have the faith that you haven't come in there to destroy the evening <laughs> that you haven't come in there to sabotage the moment because he's really hoping for this moment and the wife comes in and he's really hoping that she might be uh have put herself together well enough that that they can relate that they can have a dance together you know and so this night that we hadn't been together for three years we got together and we and we danced and we thought, huh, there it is again, this moment of being together, of allowing ourselves to accept the, mm, what is it? Accept the, um, it, it's kind of what you both need, right? You need attention because attention is love. So you want attention, but you have to give attention in order to receive attention. So you have to get yourself organized enough, even though your socks are, you know, different colors and uh, your underwear is dirty. And I mean, you're just a mess. You're just a mess. You're going to put yourself together enough to give this other person your, your despicable self you're going to give yourself to this person and it's going to be a moment that you can both be grateful for. So that that's romance really is. And that that's the beginning of romance. Now recently, so Jordan and I went, we went on tour. He was feeling still just awful <laughs> and we didn't know what was going on and he was feeling worse and worse and worse and worse. And we were in Detroit, close to Toronto. And I said, I'm going home because I don't know what to do with you. And I'd like to be on tour with you, but I just can't do it. It's just, it's too painful for me to see you like this because you're just, uh, you're just a mess. And uh, I went home and I got home and I was like, I would really like to be on tour with Jordan. Uh, I had made that decision at the beginning that I was going to do it. And here I am home and he's not here. And so I just, and I didn't even really know I was praying, but I said, what do I have to do? I just asked myself really, 
is what we think anyway. What do I have to do so that I can go on tour? And I heard a voice tell me to get my own hotel room. And I thought, wow, what, what was that? What was that? So I phoned a friend and I said, I heard a voice tell me to get my own hotel room. And she said, that's a good idea. And so I called my assistant, our assistant, and I said, book my own hotel room on the rest of the tour. And I went back on tour and I told him, I'm not staying in your bedroom anymore. I'm going to take my own room. And he thought, huh, hmm, you know, what do I, what do I think of that? I'm not quite sure what to think of that. But he and I had been together long enough that he thought, well, you know, okay, fine. Go in your own room. Let's see what happens. And turned out that Jordan, you know, when he comes home from the theater, he comes home later than me. And he's all wound up because he's been talking to lots of people and giving a lecture. And so, you know, it's a, it takes a while to calm down. It does definitely take a while to calm down. Even for me, I get up there for 10 minutes and I talk and it takes me a while to calm down. But now he's in his own room. So he can do whatever he wants in there. I'm not going to bother him. And I'm in my own room so I can sleep. And I can get up in the morning and open the drapes. Whereas when we were sharing the room, I had to keep the drapes closed and sneak out into the hallway and pray the rosary about in the hallway. And that was... So we were trying to get along, but we were impeding each other's uh, space too much that then we would become uh, resentful of one another because we would be in, be in each other's space. So you also, when you want to have romance, you have to give each other space. So, okay, so then you want to have a, a, a date with your girlfriend or with your wife. Mostly it's a problem with wives because we live in the same house. So we have to learn how to live in the same house. And uh, it's best if the wife and the husband have their own spaces, I've found. And, you know, I'm older. I'm older. I'm 62. So was that the what was that what I thought in the beginning? No. You know, we had one bedroom. We shared a bed. We thought that that was the way to, to live life. But, you know... I remember my grandparents, I went to their house. They had two single beds in the same room. I thought, don't they like each other? You know, don't they? But they seem to like each other all right. And so I took my own room and he took his own room. And it turned out that that little bit of time that we didn't spend together makes the heart grow fonder. So you don't expect, you know, if you're sharing a bed with someone, you think, well, why are you turning away to the wall? Here I am. Don't you know that I would like to be with you and to spend some time with you tonight? But if you're on, in your own rooms, then he actually has to come and knock on the door and say, um, would you like to spend some time with me? So it has to be, there's no expectations because you've put this uh, distance between each other. And so, you know, Jordan, he would come and visit me every morning. He really comes and visits me every morning. So he comes in the morning and he says, good morning. And wants to have a cuddle and it's good to have a cuddle. It's good. And, and you know, you, because you haven't spent the night together, you think like, how are you? right? How are you? Uh, how was your night? And uh, so that happens for a number of days in the week. But then it gets to the point where I think, you know what? I'd like to go see Jordan. Now that doesn't happen to me every day. It happens to him every day, but it happens to me once a week, maybe twice a week, but probably once a week that I think, you know what? I should go visit my husband. And so if I go visit my husband, this is a moment of, I think, uh, this is a moment of humility for a woman to uh, open herself up to her husband voluntarily without, he's not like offering her flowers and, 
you know, uh, making her dinner and you know, try, if I do this, will you pay attention to me? If I do this, will you pay attention to me? No, it's, it's that the woman is in a different room from her husband, but she hasn't seen him for quite a while. And she's thinking it would be good to see him. And so maybe instead of being, <laughs> I mean, you're, you're not, you've decided to keep separate rooms. So you can't be, you can't really be angry at him for not being there because you've made this decision to take your own room. So not only does he have to come and ask you for attention, you have to now go and ask him for attention. And for a woman, that's very healthy. I think for a relationship, it's very, very healthy for a woman to admit her, her vulnerability, admit what she needs, and that sets her up for uh, a generous, uh, a generous romantic encounter. So that's what I've learned recently. And I, I think people could think about that and see what they think about that. Wow. Th thank you so, so much for that answer. It was a really beautiful answer and some, some really good advice for people to, to think about in the context of their own relationships. Tammy, I feel like I could do an entire podcast with you on relationships alone. So maybe we'll do that next time. But until then, it looks as though our time is up for today. I just want to thank you so much for coming back on the podcast. It's always a pleasure and a delight to speak with you. It's been a thoroughly enjoyable hour. I have got a lot out of it personally. I hope everyone out there listening and watching has got just as much out of it as me and yes thank you so much please let everyone know who are watching and listening right now where they can find more of your work connect with you online check out your podcast where can we direct everyone to yeah well it's tammy peterson podcast uh it's on twitter if it isn't on youtube it should be on youtube but it might not be so it's on twitter and there's shorts on instagram <laughs> and there's shorts on Facebook, and I think it's going to be on Rumble as well. So you can find my podcast there. Brilliant. I will make sure all that is linked in the description below. But until next time, Tammy, thank you so much for joining me on the Freedom Pact podcast today. No, well, thank you, Lewis, and thanks for the uh, thoughtful questions. It was good. If you enjoyed this episode of the Freedom Pact podcast with Tammy Peterson, please consider subscribing to the channel for similar content and all our other podcasts as well as the highlights and best bits from this episode and all our other episodes. We're also available on audio. You can find us on all the major podcast platforms like Spotify, iTunes, wherever you get your podcasts. If you have any guest suggestions or want to reach out and just chat with us, our Instagram is Freedom Pact. Our Twitter is Freedom Pact Pod. And our email you can reach us on is freedompact at gmail.com. Look forward to seeing you and hearing from you. Thank you so much. Until next time, this has been the Freedom Pact Podcast.